I guess uh, I should not look down when I'm talking to the microphone. Um, so I'm uh, here to talk about an object-oriented finite element uh, program that we're putting together at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, and uh, all right, this really is stupid. Um, so the, the scope of this project is uh, we wanted to provide a tool for material scientists. The general motivation was many years ago, uh, some investigators, postdocs at the National Institute of Standards and Technology were trying to make a model of a microstructure that they thought was interesting. And they were trying to do fairly simple finite element stuff, mechanical properties. And uh, they were interested in, um, they had the, the spatial microstructure and they wanted to make a mesh that matched the microstructure and they wanted to make um, uh, a custom constitutive rule. Uh, they wanted to have particular properties in the, in the uh, constituents. And then the question was going to be, well, what, is the, what are the properties of the aggregate, uh, the whole system, as a function of the properties of these constituents? And it was just crazy hard. The meshing tools that were available for the commercial finite element tool uh, were, were not well adapted to microstructures. This is this slide here. Um, the, uh, so it was hard to mesh, it was hard to add the constitutive rules, and even if they had been able to do so, a lot of what the tool was doing was kind of a black box, and they wanted to be able to tinker, and they wanted to be able to, to reproduce their results, or at least know what, what was going on. So the solution was, well, we said we should write our own tool, how hard could it possibly be, right? These are the, the amateurs who don't know how hard it is. And uh, so we did that, and uh, along the way, we knew that we wanted to get uh, uh, use a methodology where we would have a relatively high level, use an existing scripting language to tie together uh, some high performance, probably C or Fortran code. And then we made the call, I think, in around 2000 to use Python. Uh, the alternative at that point was basically TCL, probably. Um, uh, and and I, it was a good call, uh, and we've stuck with it since then. Um, but we are, I think, uh, so some of the speakers here have talked about the relative vintage of their software. Uh, we almost predate Python. Uh, we, we went with Python 1.5.2 was the first version, and uh, at one point I was the Python expert on the team because I had actually run, I had run Hello World in Python and nobody else had. So again, I can't help but apologize for the awkwardness of this. Um, so this is kind of the scope of the problem. Um, this is the math and material science. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, what you have is you have some field represented by the letter phi there, and you have some equation for the field um, as a function. So the, the field evolves according to some second order in time coefficient and some first order in time coefficient, and a constitutive rule and a forcing term. And the constitutive rule is the most important thing, is the thing in yellow there. Constitutive rules tell you how the field maps to what we, what in OOF terminology is called the flux. And the flux is kind of the response function of the system. So for, this is very schematic. Um, the uh, typical mechanical properties example is the, where the, the phi field would be the displacement field and the sigma field would be the ordinary mechanical stress. Uh, there's a couple of other examples mentioned up there, I think, which I actually can't read from here. Um, going from math to finite elements is, is pretty straightforward. You just uh, integrate the weak form and you get uh, uh, discrete, you do this discretization by integrating uh, your, your continuum fields over shape functions and then the integral of the field with a shape function or the integral of the equation with a shape function gives you either an equation, uh, either a row or a column in a giant matrix and, and then the rest of it is basically matrix mechanics or matrix analysis. Uh, where are we here? So this is the this is more or less the use case, um, or the I guess the uh, the, the uh, um, operation of the software. You start with a micrograph, you segment the micrograph, you mesh the segmented micrograph, uh, and we have tools for that. And then you run the finite element code, and then you analyze the results. And uh, we also have a sort of conceptual framework that we work within that helps to kind of manage the complexity of the, of the software. Uh, so we have, this is kind of a, uh, based on a, a sort of word processor type model where you have, where this is kind of similar level of complexity where you have a lot of components. So the uh, microstructure, as you can see there, is sort of like the document, and then there are various pieces, that, the images are parts of the document, and then there's, uh, the skeletons, which are the, it's just the skeleton is the finite element sort of architecture without the physics in it. That's something that you can manipulate separately and you can have many skeletons for a given microstructure. And then the actual mesh 
um, is uh, with the skeleton with the physics, and that's the thing that you can actually do find an analysis on. And uh, so we find as we go through this that we're, we're overloading terms from time to time. So in the OOF context, for example, a field and a flux and a skeleton and a mesh have specific meanings that they may not have in other contexts. Um, so one of the steps is image segmentation that we do. We have a, a pretty broad sub-project within the OOF project that is specialized in an image segmentation. Um, and in this case, um, it, ideally, we would like to be able to automate image segmentation completely. That's an incredibly hard problem, um, not just for us. Um, and we're, um, but we have a lot of powerful tools, and we also rely to some degree on the user. So the OOF user is assumed to be kind of a domain expert in the, in the science of the material that they're analyzing, and they know better than anybody in the world what the right segmentation is. So they can recognize it when they see it. So if we give them some tools where they can kind of go in the right direction, they can find a good segmentation. And then for the finite element geometry, uh, we have a meshing scheme that involves take over overlaying the segmented image with a space-filling, well-formed mesh. And then we have a number of mesh transformation rules where you can subdivide elements or move nodes around according to various criteria, and the rules, all of the rules preserve the well-formed space-filling character of the mesh, and uh, there also are numerical tools to help uh, assess the quality of the mesh. So the primary things are we have a de facto uh, artificial energy function that we use that will tell you uh, there's an energy penalty for, for uh, elements that are too long and skinny, uh, that have bad aspect ratios because those screw up the finite element convergence, and there's an energy penalty for, no, for elements which are inhomogeneous, if the material boundary goes right through an element, then you're, that means that the skeleton or the mesh is not, is not matching up with the segmented image. And so, um, again, in this case, the, uh, the user is not expected to be an expert in meshing, but we give them the tools that they can uh, assess the meshes reasonably well. Uh, for the finite element geometry, um, that's the one I just did. One of the problems with this particular scheme is that I have some slides here that are supposed to be hidden, and they're not hidden anymore. So, constitutive rules are a very important part, uh, the ability to customize constitutive rules. So I just want to take a second to define what a constitutive rule is. It's this, as I said before, it's this mapping between fields and fluxes. It tells you how, the, how a given uh, material uh, behaves when loaded in a particular way. We have a number of built-in constitutive rules. Uh, for all the sort of simple things, linear elasticity, uh, thermal conduction, um, chemical conduction, uh, all the sort of easy stuff we've done. And we have this extension framework, which I will talk more about in a minute, so I'm going to skip over some of this. Um, also, uh, we have some pretty advanced uh, linear algebra. Again, this is a thing where we think we're making a pretty considerable contribution. Um, over someone who would write their own finite element code. Uh, we're not doing better than the commercial finite element codes here, but we think we already have other advantages over the commercial finite element codes. And here, we've paid a fair amount of attention. There are people at NIST who are experts in GM res and various other kinds of solvers, and so we have some, we think, uh, pretty good libraries. So again, if, if someone is a, again, the whole goal is to bring enormous computational power and good resources to somebody who is a material science expert, but who doesn't want to code or doesn't want to code very much. So this is more about that. I guess this is. So in the analysis of the results, there's a lot of fair amount of built-in tools where you can, of course, make contour plots of the fields and contour plots of the fluxes, or if they're vectors or tensors, you can make contour plots of their invariants. Uh, one of the puzzles here for the OOF team is kind of when to stop. Uh, we don't know if we've solved that problem. We built a bunch of tools, but sometimes we get requests for people who would like to be able to, you know, sort of take higher order moments of the statistics of various fields. And if anybody asks, we'll probably do it if it's something you know, that, that's reasonably easy to do. But at some point, I mean, you have to wonder about when we should hand this off to, to a better tool that really can do a better job. Um, uh, I think that one was supposed to be hidden. But it does, it's worth uh, mentioning that we have both a GUI front end and a menu 
scheme, and actually, uh, in light of the previous talk, one of the things we did for our menu operations, the menus, the arguments to the menu system uh, are objects which, um, believe it or not, we also call parameters, but parameters are type-aware container objects. Um, I don't think they're quite as clean and nice as the, as the parameter talk that we just saw, but there, it's clearly, this is a, a, a solution that has been reinvented uh, several times. Um, so the architecture was, as I discussed a little bit earlier, um, it's Python and C++. This is partly an artifact of the time at which we made the various calls that we needed to. Uh, we don't actually use the SciPy and NumPy libraries, although we are always keeping an eye on them, and we're very impressed with what's going on. There may be a time when we will make the jump. Um, uh, but we, so we, are, we have a top level that is Python, and has, we've enjoyed the advantages of Python enormously. We can rapidly prototype. We can just try stuff and, and, and learn very quickly whether it works or not. Um, we have most of our numerical stuff in C++, and they're tied together with SWIG, uh, which has been great. Um, and uh, so the other point about SWIG, actually, is uh, one of the advantages of this is we have occasionally in the application had issues where we run into performance problems in some of the Python, and one of the things you can do with SWIG reasonably easily is move the C Python boundary around. So if you find, you can move it either way. If you find you're having trouble, if something's, you know, you find you're having to make, make a lot of changes in something and it's really more dynamic than you expected it was going to be, you can, you can move the swig boundary down and pull that up into Python. Uh, or you can go the other way if something's not performing well enough, but it's, it's reasonably static and the dynamism of Python isn't, isn't doing you any good there, you can change where you put the swig stuff and move the boundary up. Uh, so that's been handy. We've done that more than once. Uh, so it mostly runs on, on uh, Unix-like systems. There's no Windows version. Um, and this actually the slide is slightly out of date. Uh, the, the 3D is, is very much active, the thing that's at the bottom there. Uh, so the current release is 2.1.7. It's a two-dimensional code. Um, I don't remember what's on there, and I can't see it from here. So we have uh, orientation. Uh, Sensitivity, we're doing some work with plasticity and some fairly serious and interesting nonlinearities, which I will talk about more in a minute. Um, so, and the, the really, the major focus on development at this point is 3D, and also there's an effort going on with surface properties. One of the issues with finite element code sometimes is you, when you have rapid transitions, if you can explicitly model something with a surface element, you can sometimes do better than if you try and actually do the full real space model. So you can. That's an abstraction that we're, we're working on implementing. Um, this is my uh, electron backscatter orientation example, which I think I will not spend much time on. That's another one. So this is the example that I really want to talk about because this is great fun. Um, so we have this, um, damn it. We have this uh, extensibility scheme, and we, we had a nonlinear property API, and about a year, a little over a year ago, a graduate student from Northwestern University emailed me and said, uh, I have this material, and I want to fake plasticity, and the way I want to fake it is I have this, I have this uh, constitutive rule called Ramberg-Osgood elasticity. And what Ramberg-Osgood elasticity is, is it has a low displacement curve that is like the one you see on there. When you strain the system, initially there is a lot of stress, and after you get past a certain level of stress, the, the, the additional stress gets much lower. And uh, so that's, there, that's, uh, that's indicated on, on those two curves. The one curve is a flipped over version of the other one. The one on the right is the more conventional low displacement orientation, and the one on the left is the way in which the Ramberg Osgood uh, elasticity is actually typically written. I thought this was great. It was like I had never heard of it. And, and, but it was magnificently nonlinear, and I thought, well, this is a really good test of, of the um, nonlinear property API for OOF, so let's, let's give it a go. And so, of course, I you know, prototyped it out in Python. So here is the, the actual math, and I don't mean to frighten people too much with the equations. The, the initial one here, look, I can point at this because this is all screwed up. Um, so the first two terms in here are just ordinary linear elasticity is typical Hooke's law, and then there's this other term that says that the amount of strain that you have for a given amount of stress is this Q over some scale factor to some power, um, what was that about, okay, times, some, times a, a tensor that tells you how much of this is deviatory, thank you. 
Um, and the, the, the Q factor is, is written here. It's, the, it's the, essentially the, the magnitude of the deviatoric part of the stress. So this, that's a lot of, that may be a little bit of word salad for some of you. Uh, stress is a tensor. The deviatoric part is basically the, ma is the, the, the part of the stress that doesn't have any compression in it. So it's all, it's, it's, if, it, if it's sheared in any direction, this number is large. If you just press, it, press on it or pull on it uniformly, hydrostatically, this number is small. Uh, and the, the coefficients there are the ordinary coefficients. Um, so this is a, a reprise of the, of the constitutive rule illustrating one of the complications, which is that um, it's an implicit, so in, in the OOF scheme, what we want is we have constitutive rules that are stress as a function of the strain or stress as a function of the linear combinations and derivatives of the displacement. And this particular rule doesn't do that, it's the, it goes the other way. But that turns out not to be a problem for us. Um, handling this, again, Python was instrumental in being able to just try this at, so you know, how do, can we just solve this implicitly by doing a little newton raphson inside the constitutive rule? How horrible is that? And the answer, you can just, it takes 10 minutes to try, well, all right, it took half a day. Um, and uh, turns out that works very well. And so I did put together, um, a microstructure that does this, and kind of, this might be the, <coughs> excuse me, kind of the hello world of material science, you might, if you want to think about it this way. The point of this example partly is to illustrate the implementation of this ramberg osgood plasticity rule, but also this is a microstructure where, uh, obviously synthetic, I made this up, I put, did this in a drawing program, where the area fraction of the blue and the gray parts are the same. So if you had something that assessed this material as a function of area fraction, you would make a serious mistake. And I'm gonna, go down to the, closer to the punchline. I guess not quite that close. So all four possibilities were explored where, so if everything is linear, that's one system. If the uh, inclusions are nonlinear and the matrix is linear, that's another one. If it's the other way around, that's another one. If everything is nonlinear, so that's, that's the four possibilities for nonlinear, linear and nonlinear. Uh, Again, I cannot help but apologize for how awkward this is. Um, so here are load displacement curves for each of these combinations, and they're, they go the way you expect, or at least they went the way I expected. The fully linear system is the stiffest, the fully nonlinear system is the softest, and uh, I was very gratified that my intuition was met that the system with the nonlinear softening matrix is softer than the one with the nonlinear soften inclusions because the matrix percolates across the whole system and so when the whole, that can all go soft uh, so that when you're, when you're applying tractions on the boundaries that's softer than the other way around even though, in, as I said, in both cases the area fraction uh, is the same in both cases. So um, again, the reason this is the hello world of material science is the fundamental axiom of material science is that structure controls properties. And, and here we see the two different structures. Even everything, everything is the same about these except the structures, and that's what's controlling the properties. So that's a nice little story that we can tell. It's, a, it's an OOF story, it's a mechanical property story, and it's also a Python story. Um, and of course, this isn't something I do by myself. This is our team. Uh, we have a number of contributors who are currently contributing, and a number of former contributors. We've had many postdocs and summer students uh, contributing enormous value throughout the years. So, thank you and sorry again for the display horror show.